morning, everybody. Oh, I need more coffee. Morning, everybody. Much better. Thank you. All right. Um, so I'm going to take the next 15, 20 minutes here to talk to you a little bit about industrial AI. Now, what is industrial? When I talk about industrial AI or industrial solutions, I'm really meaning the entire gamut of in heavy industries. So construction, mining, manufacturing, oil and gas, um, chemical and petroleum. It's the entire gamut of space. So electricity and utility. So what we'll talk a little bit about is, and I'll set up the stage with the why very quickly. I'll talk a little bit about uh, the what we're doing and how we, at least at Spark Cognition, have been working with, uh, over the last five years, a number of companies around the world and how we bring some of these solutions to life. So again, I'm not going to spend too much time on the setup because I think most of you are quite familiar here with the fact that these systems are very complex, right? I mean, um, we, we think about an aircraft, think about a drilling rig, think about an offshore platform, think about a power system. These are very complex, but the common thing here is that they all have assets that are large volumes, small volumes, very heavy value that generate something, that produce something. And these things are critical for infrastructure. These things are what power cities, these things are po what power governments, what power countries. This is what takes humankind from one place to the other, right? Fuel, steam, electricity, all the things that were used and heavily sort of uh, um, uh, made popularized in the first, second, and the third industrial revolution. So it's all of those core pieces. But the other common thing is that they all produce data. And as an example, let's talk about a power generation system. It's a pretty complicated system. This is a very, very simple schematic of what a power generating system is. But if you think about combustion turbines, these are $100 million equipments. If you think about uh, gas turbines, the number of pumps that you need to power these systems, these are, again, the key point here is that these are very, very complex. Now, there are two things that are truly common across these that most of us are really looking for. One is to increase the reliability and the efficiency and to maximize the output, the throughput that you get from these systems. And number two is you want to minimize the unscheduled and unnecessary expenses that go in, the inefficiencies that are going in, whether it's power, whether it is people, whether it is processes, whether it is systems, you want to minimize all of that. Now, it has been done for a long time through you know, various techniques over decades, uh, predictive maintenance, right? How do you do monitoring? How do you do, how do, you do people? Uh, how do you apply people to govern these types of systems? What kind of optimization? optimization techniques you'd use. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, predictive maintenance is a term that is, you know, most of you are probably very familiar with. It is not something new. It is something that has happened for a long time, right? In any process that you take, you want to know what happened. You want to know why it happened. Or why it happened. Uh, you want to know, you know, what is happening now. And then as we are evolving, we want to know before something happens, and you want to know why something happens in a reliable manner, right? We, we heard a little bit about rumors, uh, but it's, it's a little bit different in systems because there are not people spreading rumors, but there is information or data that is providing potentially false alarms, which, you know, once, it, once you have false alarms happening enough number of times, people start ignoring it so that when the real alarms do come, you're not really ready to take action. So th these are sort of evolving systems that you really need to think about and worry about. So even though these um, solutions have been around for a very long time, uh, there are catastrophic failures that happen even today, right? And it is unfortunate, but these do happen. Now, there are few and far between but there are expensive failures that can cause uh, property damage, that can, cause, that can be life-threatening, that can cause human damage as well. So these are something that you know, we're all truly focused on and truly looking at ways to address it, truly looking at ways to solve these problems. So as I mentioned, where the objective is really to go all the way to the top of that um, stack in terms of having 
a regular operating system and environment, operating environment where you have as much planning as possible, right? And of course, the thing that is not really helping is the fact that a lot of the expertise that we have built in human systems over the years is continuously eroding, right? And the things that were in people's minds is what we really need to figure out how we codify into systems so these systems can self-correct, can self-sustain themselves as well. Now, that does not mean that the humans are going to go away, but that just means how humans are really going to augment and work with these systems going forward more efficiently. So let me talk about how we have seen uh, what we are doing this, and uh, this is something that McKinsey put out there uh, a couple years ago, which is truly relevant in terms of the journey that you need to take, taking uh, you know, digital data that is being produced by, from, and around the context of these systems, and being able to build out the, advan uh, the entire infrastructure, drive the analysis, and then provide actionable insights. Now, the actionable insights is truly important because it is about separating the noise from the signal, right? And ultimately, that's really what we are all after. So let me talk a little bit about how we in Spark Cognition, um, we're an AI company out of Austin, Texas, and our products are really designed to work across these kinds of complex systems, as I mentioned, across the entire spectrum of industrial areas, and bring together to life uh, a number of different insights that you can start leveraging. Now, it is, uh, even though we're a small company, we have actually four different products, and I'll spend a couple minutes on each one just describing what each of these products really do, because then I'll bring it back together and show how we're taking all of these things and solving true problems uh, in, in, these in, in these areas. So let me start with Spark Predict. So Spark Predict, uh, and I'm going to just run a quick um, video in terms of what we're doing here, but Spark Predict, so this is actually uh, just a recorded demo, but uh, what we do with Spark Predict, it is designed for operators, it is designed for managers. As you can see, this is an, uh, an out-of-the-box user interface that we have that shows you all your assets there on the, on the right. It shows you the fact that from the data, it determines what assets are working normally and where's the anomaly. It continuously streams information from these systems, and we apply machine learning algorithms, a variety of machine learning algorithms, to come up with a snapshot of cards. Now, these are operating states within each of these assets that are based on certain time parameters that we determine. It shows you all of the features here on the left that are really impacting the current operating condition. Now, as you zoom in, uh, an operator can pick the right kind of features, whether it's an ambient temperature or humidity that is causing a certain problem, can continue to probe into and see the uh, seek the diagnosis and determine where the challenges are. Not only that, as I mentioned, is as the operator finds a challenge or finds something that is potentially an unrecognized state by the machine, they can retrain the system from right there. And that, to me, is truly important because it is about building these reliable systems, which to me is one key characteristic when you're th thinking about a trust-based AI system. And so this is where uh, Spark Predict truly shines within a number of these solutions that we've deployed. Now, it's been deployed at offshore drilling rigs to electricity and utility companies, uh, and it is something that we continue to find uh, a lot of uh, usage on in terms of predicting problems and explaining the problem. It's not just about there is a problem, I just don't know where. It is about there is a problem, here's where it is, and here's potential things you need to watch out for based completely on the system uh, providing that information from the data. Now, if you think about where does that go next, um, the, the next logical question is, well, this is great, but tell me now, how do I fix these problems, or what do I do about these problems? So here's, for, for example, where a system like DeepNLP would come in, a product like DeepNLP comes in, because DeepNLP looks at manuals, looks at large and small amounts of data and text, 
and it can convert that pieces of text into a structured data. So it looks at unstructured data and converts it into, un into structured text. Now it can do this across millions of documents based on a small number of annotations. The difference between what DeepNLP does versus a number of natural language processings that are out there it is, is, it, is that it is a full system. It is a full workflow where it is designed for domain experts to annotate documents, to do segmentation or classification with small numbers of examples. And then DeepNLP does that on millions of documents. So it's almost as easy as, as I mentioned, dragging and dropping. For somebody who is not an NLP or a design uh, or a software engineering expert, they can do this fairly quickly. And then to a point where now you can start looking for the right kinds of information. So imagine, the amount of content, the amount of data that is hidden in these large volumes of manuals, research reports, logs, and being able to now have access to all of that in a fairly structured manner that you can actually do some simple queries on, simple lookups on, and then you can also run some basic analysis on that. And that, to me, becomes truly differentiating because now you're taking what we did with Spark Predict around predicting problems, explaining problems, and then the next thing you're doing is now you're determining how do you actually address these problems. DeepNLP, as I mentioned, is, is uh, designed to be more agnostic of the data, so it is also something that you can apply in other domains, like think about contracts, think about call centers, where you're actually getting calls from users, Think about little pieces of text or notes that uh, people are taking, your subject matter experts are taking, and being able to then process those intelligently. So that's another example where DeepNLP truly uh, is being used. Now, uh, let me take the third piece here, which is uh, Darwin. Now, Darwin, um, as a testimony to Charles Darwin, is really our AI tool that is using AI to build AI. Now, what does that really mean? Is that Darwin uses um, genetic evolutionary, uh, uh, genetic engineering techniques and an evolutionary approach to find models. Now, this is designed to operate on structured data. So if you think about, in this particular case, a pump's operating state, you're trying to predict the operating state of the, of the pump, you take any structured data like that where you're trying to find, let's say, a sample of data that you've collected, where in this particular case, you're trying to find a category that you're predicting. What state is that in? What we do is we build an entire neural network architecture from scratch. This is what the tool does underneath the covers, where it produces hundreds or thousands of models. It mutates values, right, whether it's the layers of the architecture or, or others, and then it creates the one model. When you then look at the results, um, you can actually upload a test data set. And then as you see on the, on the left here, it shows you the specific features that truly caused the uh, impact of the outcome that it predicted. You can compare the results within just a matter of five minutes. You saw there that it was giving you a 95% accuracy, which is pretty high um, for that kind of result set. There's also a Python SDK, so it's an API-based or a user interface-based approach. But the key thing here to note is that it gives you the visibility and the transparency, which is another, cap another factor, another very key factor of a trust-based AI system is to know what impacted my outcome. So if you have 100 different ways that you use to determine, uh, determine what the operating uh, state is. So for example, if I'm, a, uh, if I'm a telco company and I want to find out why are my customers leaving my company and moving to another company, there's probably 100 different reasons for that happening. Now if I collect all of that data, I can actually start predicting patterns in terms of what is causing that. And, I, and what Darwin does is it allows you to get a specific visibility into not just the entire set of data, but also for the specific customers as well. So that's, again, to me, we talked about trust in the morning. Reliability was one key factor. Transparency and explainability is the second key factor. All of these are, are actually ingrained into the core products that we do. Now, what is Deep Armor? Deep Armor is our way of applying AI to security. And uh, Deep Armor is actually one of the best endpoint products, uh, protection products in the market 
specifically designed for the unknown unknowns. Now, we talked about infrastructure. If you think about the amount of, um, amount of compute and data that is being pushed to the different infrastructures, they're all susceptible to attacks. They're all susceptible to malware. What, Deep Ar what we've done with Deep Armor is we've given millions of, uh, of threats to Deep Armor, and we've trained the product to be able to detect the core characteristics of the threat. So unlike a lot of the endpoint protections that have been around for years, what we have really done is we focused Deep Armor to know the core characteristics of what is a threat and what is not, as opposed to being able to use a signature, right? So if you all probably use some kind of an endpoint protection, you see these pesky uh, signature updates that happen. So it comes with a, you know, again, for an admin, uh, there's a full-fledged uh, user interface to show you the visibility into where the attacks are, how do you remediate them. And then what's also very interesting is this uh, key thing that we've got here called the risk. So just like we can assess the risk of systems, we can also assess the risk of IT systems, in this case, operation systems and assets. You can also assess whether or not a particular system is truly vulnerable for an attack and take action before the attack happens rather than after. So, and, and again, this is something that we have on Windows, Apple, uh, Mac OS, and actually also on Linux. Um, so Deep Armor is really, as I mentioned, the core uh, capability in the product that we have that is designed for the security side of, um, of uh, protecting your assets. So across these, um, core four products, as I mentioned, they can all be brought together to be able to address a variety of different aspects of the solution so that you're protecting your assets from both scheduled problems, unscheduled problems, and safety issues. And that, to me, is how you get the entire system in place, and you can do this one step at a time. You can start in any of these different places. So there's multiple different entry points, and you can start potentially anywhere. But these are how these products truly come together and have been helping clients throughout the world. Now, um, and just real quick, I'm just going to flash this, but there are a number of different solutions that are being used today um, at over a, about 100 clients around the world, across from predictive maintenance, being able to do decision support, uh, uh, being able to um, automate a set of workflows, uh, being able to use optimization, uh, being able to optimize your processes as well. So um, again, it's, it's truly interesting in terms of how these products were designed and how they're really continuing to get evolved to be used in more and more solutions. Now, as I mentioned, even though we focused on industrial automation, as you can see, Deep NLP, Darwin are both designed for working on unstructured and structured data sets that truly work in a number of different areas, including, for example, you know, scenarios where you have a lot of data uh, that you're collecting, um, including in scenarios where you have uh, predictions that you make across both structured and unstructured data sets. So um, very quickly then, as I mentioned, our core mission and our focus, and I truly believe that this is something in the next 20, 30, 40 years, um, starting from now actually, is that the, the entire space of AI is at the core of the intersection of the physical and the cyber world. And obviously the humans are at the center of it, but this is where we believe that the technology truly comes in. So real quickly, summarizing as I mentioned, you know, when we talk about digitization, it is not single project, you know, we heard before, uh, it is a journey, it is a long-term journey. It is something that uh, I find a lot of companies spending a lot of time analyzing. The idea is, you know, you've got to analyze, but you've got to start, and chances are you will make mistakes in the beginning, but if you don't start, your, your mistakes are going to be more expensive as you, as you continue to drive that forward. And you want to plan for the entire, um, entire stack, and develop you know, very incrementally so you de-risk yourself. And so again, I really want to thank you all very much. Uh, that's all I had to say. Uh, for, the smart, uh, sorry. for the smarter ones, they obviously understood what the hell was going on. Uh, for, but for the normal human mortals like me, I have to translate this into English, uh, with your permission. Please. Um, I, 
I mean, it's amazing what uh, the company is doing, but I encountered uh, Spark Cognition the first time last year at a major conference called RD Petro, organized by Adnoc. And I had an insight, and I'll share that with you, and, um, and Philippe, who's here also as the VP Solutions, and that was that in the oil industry, the oil industry was fast asleep because they're making tons of money. And then the oil price went down, and everybody said, oops, we're in trouble. So going out there and looking for new oil wells and new resources and stuff like that is far more difficult. But just by about half to 1% efficiency in their costs, they can fundamentally change profitability and availability of all of the, of the oil that we need. Just half percent by the work that... And this is where people like Spark Cognition come in. They give the oil industry a half a percent enhancement of efficiency and productivity, which doubles, which actually represents about 50% of our requirements for new oil. That is, to me, was the thing that, I, that they can come in and give a half to 1% increase in productivity and change the game. And this, to me, was my core insight. Thoughts on that, sir? No, that's absolutely right. I think, um, you know, half percent is a start. It sounds small. But the needle in the industrial space, if, you know, if you've worked in that space, yeah. a half percent in an improvement can translate to orders of magnitude of returns on your investment, um, especially for the core and key resources that we're talking about here. Uh, but as I mentioned, we're, we're seeing that the, the kinds of changes, in fact, uh, it, it, the other area is also, you mentioned oil and gas, electricity and utilities, another mm -hmm. one, where you see uh, 40, 50 X times the returns by doing small changes like we talked about okay. here. And one more question from my side, and then we'll open up uh, one or two burning questions from there. How do you kick GE, uh, Baker Hughes, Schlumberger, and IBM's butt regularly? We like to think of them as, uh, you know, I mean, it's all part of an ecosystem. I think uh, having been a CTO of IBM Watson, I, I spent a long time <laughs> with IBM. Um, I, I have tremendous respect for all of these companies. But I think one of the things that I realized um, is that innovation comes from when you're really unencumbered. Mm -hmm. And so when you're in a smaller organization, there's a lot of tremendous amount of opportunity to innovate, to really apply a very focused way of solving problems, which is really one of the approaches that we've taken with AI. And as I mentioned, even though we have four different products, there's a common underlying theme, the common underlying platform. And so um, it, we've built a great, a great pool of talent within our company as well. And uh, actually, we do have people from a number of the companies that you mentioned there uh, by the way, we do work with some of these companies as well. So I, I, I wouldn't say kicking butt is probably a great example, but, but I, I mean, just uh, you can say. He's being, mod he's being modest, <laughs> yeah, kicking them like anything. Okay, a couple of quick questions. Y yes, sir. Oh, oil company, PDO. They want to know how they can <laughs> increase half a percent. <laughs> I, I have to say something. Please. <laughs> I think it, the, for me, what I would look at it in a different way is about co-innovation and how we can work together, especially as an operator. Mm -hmm. We don't have everything. We've got something, and uh, you know, the SEPs provide a, play a bigger role as partnership to help us bring in efficiency and, and so forth and so on. Uh, one of the areas where I could say, relative to comparing with the bigger companies, I think the smaller companies are game changer. And the reason why they're game changers, you mentioned by innovation. I think it, smaller company things could be done quicker and faster and, and you know, that communication back and forth is easy. When you look into bigger companies, sometimes the governors, the structure of changing things take too long and so on. But it, the key message is partnership, co-innovation is the way forward. Great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, you know, you're, you're very correct because we are all about agility and speed. Um, and we are all about innovation and applying focus. So, you know, if there are opportunities uh, from that standpoint in terms of partnering, there's a number of different areas that we could definitely partner in. Super. One final question. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, very impressive uh, presentation. The spectrum is thank amazing. You. 
uh, I'm, I'm Samha Abdultagi from Optomatica, and I'm particularly interested in the deep NLP. Uh... You have too much energy. You see, yeah. that's the problem. It uh, is completely okay. exploding Appar everything. Apparently <laughs> so. Uh, so uh, you mentioned that, uh, that the goal of the system is to take text and, and uh, uh, unstructured text and, and turn it into... Th this is the holy grail of, of text analytics in general. So can you tell me a little bit more about what exactly is being uh, extracted? I'm assuming it's relation extraction, but I'd, I'd like to know more. And uh, the second question is that you mentioned it was domain agnostic. So that, that does, does that mean you don't have to retrain it in, in a different domain? Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Great questions. So the question was around deep NLP, and uh, the, first piece, the first part of it is, what are we extracting? So you're right, it is a complex space, you know, having spent many, many years in doing uh, natural language processing, I think one of the things that I find truly fundamentally differentiating with what we do with deep NLP uh, is the fact that it does, you know, document segmentation. When I say document, it's not just documents, right? It is uh, well-formed documents, it's also short-form text like what you get from calls and logs that people write. Uh, but it's segmentation, classification, topic extraction, entity detection, relationship, sentiment. It's the entire spectrum of things. And that's why I said it's a full system where there's a workflow that is built in because most NLP systems, most natural language processing systems, are designed to work between three main types of users. One is the user who is consuming the information. Two is the user who is working with the system to provide some guidance and training. Three is a super user like the NLP engineer or the software engineer. And NL Deep NLP is designed to work with all of those three. And when I mention it is uh, domain agnostic, the, uh, the, there, it, there are unsupervised ways where the system produces uh, inf information and insight out of the box for certain domains. But what I also meant by that was that you can apply it not just in the industrial documentation and text, you can also apply it in banking, in finance, in, uh, in call centers, um, in contract lifecycle management, in a number of different areas, in a number of different potential um, uh, application areas. And so that's uh, essentially what I meant by being domain agnostic. Super. All right, thank you Good very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed, real pleasure. Thank uh, you. Big hand for Sridhar and the company.